Welcome to One Wild World, where today we're delving into a tale that's as unexpected as it is transformative. In the spotlight is Dr. Isabel Zott, a behavioral research scientist with APOPO, an organization that's turning the animal kingdom's most underrated members into heroes of humanity. Now, when you think of rats, you might not picture lifesavers, but that's exactly what we're talking about today. These creatures, often relegated to the shadows of our minds, are stepping into the light as pioneers in scent detection. These rats are unearthing landmines, sniffing out tuberculosis, and they're even aiding in disaster rescue missions, redefining what it means to be a savior. Dr. Zott is here to guide us through this extraordinary journey, shedding light on why rats are not just capable, but they're exceptional. It's a conversation that challenges perspectives, breaks down barriers, and introduces us to the unsung heroes making a monumental impact across the world. We're about to dive deep into the world of scent detection animals with Dr. Isabel Zott, right here on One Wild World. Izzy, welcome, and thanks for being on the show today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So can you tell us a little bit about APOPO, and then what does it mean to be a behavioral research scientist? Yeah, sure. I have been working with APOPO for two and a half years now. APOPO is a Belgian NGO. We are headquartered and based in Morogoro in Tanzania, so in East Africa, And we train scent detection animals for humanitarian purposes. We are most known for African giant pouched rats, which we have two active programs with. Our rats are detecting landmines and unexploded ordinances in former conflict zones. And they also detect tuberculosis bacteria in human samples. So they help screen human samples to detect TB in patients. Uh, I am part of the research department, part of the team that are looking at other applications that our rats could be working in, trying to come up with new and innovative methods to work with them and to apply them for good purposes. And then aside from the rats, we also train dogs, scent detection dogs, which for our department, they're called technical survey dogs, who are working also in the mine clearance and demining sector. Amazing. How did you first find your passion for animals? And then can you take us through the journey that led you to working with Apopo? I've always loved animals. I've grown up with cats and dogs and, and horses around me a lot. But I never really realized that I could make a career out of it. When I was very young, I wanted to be a vet. And then I realized that would mean dealing with a lot of people and euthanizing animals. So I was like, nah, I don't want to do this. And then I was looking around a long time and after I finished school, did some volunteering. I grew up in Germany and I made a friend from England and she was like, why don't you study zoology or animal behavior or wildlife conservation or this or this or this? And I was like, what are you talking about? What are these things? And looked into it and realized other countries offer different degrees and then decided to study animal behavior in Liverpool in the UK which was the perfect thing of what I wanted to do. I really wanted to be in the wild, observe animals, study them, understand more why they are doing what they're doing and how we can communicate with them better. So I studied animal behavior for my undergraduate degree and became really interested in animal cognition and learning, emotional intelligence and things like that. So I then went on and did a master's degree working with rhesus macaques, which are a type of monkey that you very commonly find in Southeast Asia. So in Thailand, for example, when you go to the temples, you will find macaques. And I worked with these monkeys on a big project looking to develop new methods to assess their welfare in captivity and figure out how we can early on identify if they are suffering, if something is wrong, so that early on we can intervene and make it right. And that was a really cool project. We clicker train monkeys. So clicker training, for those of you who don't know, is basically just pairing the sound of a click, literally the click sound, with something good, which for the monkeys was peanuts or raisins. And you can then communicate with these animals that if they're doing the right thing, you click and they know they're going to get a food reward. So they're going to keep doing this because they want to keep their food reward. So we clicker train these monkeys to just come and sit still so we could show them pictures. That was a really cool project. After that, I then did my PhD. And for that, I moved to South Africa and I studied African elephants in a national park to look at how wildlife tourism, so you and me going on safari and watching elephants, how that affects their behavior and how they cope with this. 
So that involved a lot of behavior observations of them in the field, collecting a boatload of dump samples for hormone analysis and looking at their stress hormones, which made for great stories when people came and checked my freezer and found just lots of bags of elephant dung and yeah, and looking at their movement. And then after that, I I knew I wanted to get back to Africa. I had a very big passion for elephants and for Africa. I wanted to live and work here and was looking for positions when I came across the position with a football, which obviously working with rats is very different from working with animals. But it ticked a lot of boxes in terms of doing something with a purpose, doing something good, working with animals, being in Africa. So I applied and here I am. Wonderful. So I first found out about Apopo when I was scrolling through social media and came across this post about hero rats. And it just immediately fascinated me. I think this is the quickest turnaround between me learning about a new organization and then being like, oh my gosh, we have to have a conversation with them on the podcast. Mm -hmm. But these hero rats are African giant pouch rats. And like you said, they get used because of their sense of smell to help detect lots of different things. And the first way that I learned about them was through their use of detecting landmines. Do you know how that idea came about to use rats to detect landmines? So the idea came about with the founders of Apopo, and one of them had kept rats as pets. So he was very aware how smart they are, how good their sense of smell is. And then I think from there, there was a whole lot of trial and error. There are very fascinating and funny stories about how they came to figure out how we best train these rats and create the environment in which to train them in. But they decided, okay, African giant pouch rats are a great species because they live very long. So their average lifespan is up to eight years in the wild, which means if I invest all this time training this animal, they then have a working life ahead of them. If you trained a laboratory rat, which has an average lifespan of a few years for such a long time, and then you deploy them and their lifespan is over, that's a very bad investment. And in the end, unfortunately, with a lot of these things, we also have to keep the cost efficiency and things like that in mind. So that's how they ended up with this species of rat, the African giant pouch rat. So then from there, I think they moved to East Africa, to Tanzania, because the rats are native here. So they occur naturally here. They do not occur naturally in Belgium. (laughs) And from there, it was just onwards and upwards and really figuring out how can these rats detect TNT? How can we deploy them to clear landmines and to clear these big wide areas? And yeah, how can we have a good impact? How long does that training last? I know you said that these rats live for eight years, but how long does that training last before they're ready to go out in the field with handlers to detect for these things? It depends on the rat. There are individual differences in how fast they learn. I think average number that often comes about is about nine months. So yeah, I would say nine months to a year from we breed our own rats here. So when they are born, they begin habituation to people and being socialized, so they're happy to be handled. And then when they are 10 weeks old, we wean them from their mothers. And then the real training starts. So really from the beginning, they are signed to be a mine detection rat and then they begin their training. Amazing. And then I'm curious what a day in the field looks like with these rats. Do they just have one handler when they're out in the field? We've talked previously on the podcast with dog handlers and dog detection units. And so the dog is always on leash. Is the rat always on leash? And is there like a team of people that work with them? And then can you tell us once the rat detects something, how do they communicate to you that they've made a detection? Yeah, so again, it kind of depends on the program, but for our mine detection rats, the the day starts very early. They are naturally nocturnal, so we're trying to get into the field before it's too late in the day, before it's too hot. So they start their training at 6.30 in the morning, and at that point, our trainers and handlers and supervisors get to the office. The rats are all put in their transport cages, and they drive to the field. We have a training field here in Morogoro where we have a whole lot of deactivated landmines that are buried. And this is where the rats are working and searching for them. Whilst they are searching, they are actually attached to a leash. So the way it works is that you have two trainers standing on either side of an area. And between them is a rope. And the rat walks along this rope from one handler to the next. And then they take a step sideways and the rat walks back to the other trainer. So it's very systematic search because we have to make sure we are scanning every inch and we're not missing a square meter in which the landmine could be in the end. 
So during the search, the rat is attached to this rope to make sure they are searching very systematically. But it's the thing that our trainers don't have to do, but like to do is at the end of the session, they unleash the rat and they are walking back towards the transport cage and the rat follows their handler. So you will see this little rat after their job well done, hopping back to its transport cage and then tucking itself away and just being quite happy until they return back home. They do work with a range of handlers. So unlike dogs, our rats are transferable between handlers. They will quite happily work for the person who has the food. That's the magic trick. (laughs) That was something that I wanted to ask about next is how do you reward these rats or what is their reward of choice? Yeah, like I said earlier, they are trained with clicker training. So what they learn is that the click sound means they're going to get the food reward. And this varies a bit. For example, in the field, it might be a piece of banana or a peanut. It could also be a sort of mixture of crushed up pellets, rodent pellets that we mix with avocado and banana. But they have quite a wide variety in diet. So whilst for training, we are trying to keep the high value reward to really make this very motivating to earn. They also get fed watermelon and tomato and corn and little sardines, a whole range. It will quite often happen that our rats are out in the field and they will find some seeds and then they're starting to eat the seeds instead of work. (laughs) Yeah, whatever they can find, really. And then you described them as these aren't just your regular lab rat or like city rat that we might think of, that they truly live up to their name of being giant. Can you do your best to describe these rats compared to a regular lab rat? So on average, the weight of our rats is around 1 to 1.5 kilograms, which you might just have to do that conversion yourself. They will happily sit on your shoulder. If you take one of our biggest rats, it would probably be a similar size to a small cat or coming close. So yeah, they, they are big. They come in different sizes. Again, there's differences between them. Some are just naturally a bit smaller. One of my biggest rats, Teddy, is about 1.7 kilograms. So it, yeah, it varies. And the idea is basically, especially with the landmine detecting rats, that they're still too light to set off the landmines. Is that correct? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Are there any misconceptions that you've experienced working with rats that you want to break down? I feel like they get a bad rep. Yes, absolutely. I think a lot of people, when they think of rats, think of disease and and, and the wet canal rats that you see when you're out in the city very early in the morning or something. They are actually very clean animals. You will see our rats grooming themselves constantly. They get wet in the morning when we go to the field and there's a bit of dew on the grass and they get wet. They're like, sorry, I can't work right now. I have to groom myself first. Of course, our rats here are all vaccinated and have a vet on site. So they obviously get great health care. But I think people generally just tend to see them as vermin that needs to be extinguished. And we're always trying to convince people that there's a lot of varied sides and perspectives to them. Their sense of smell is incredible. There's a reason they are doing so well in such a wide range of environments. They're very adaptable and smart. Wonderful. I kind of want to transition away from the landmine detecting rats. One of the most illegally trafficked animals is the pangolin, which are often described for listeners that don't know as a scaly anteater. And they're often trafficked because of these scales. And I know that you are leading a program to combat this trafficking of animals and of wildlife parts. Can you explain how you got started with that project and then some of its goals? Yeah, so I call them smug rats because we're catching smugglers, <laughs> but this is not their official title. So this is one of our research projects where a few years back, the Endangered Wildlife Trust, which is an NGO in South Africa, approached us and said, hey, you've got these rats and we've got this problem. We were wondering if your rats could help with this. And we looked at it and said, yes, this sounds like a great opportunity. Let's explore it further. And like you said, a lot of illegal wildlife trafficking is done very organized and on a very large scale through shipping containers. So we wanted to see if our rats can detect wildlife products in shipping containers. And we've been training them to detect the scent of products such as pangolin scales and tell it apart from other things, right? So they need to be able to tell, okay, this is pangolin, this is not. You asked earlier how our rats indicate and communicate to us the presence of something. And that depends a bit on the project. Our mine detection rats, when they detect a landmine in the ground, they will scratch the surface. That is their signal that they give us. 
for my rats, the wildlife detection rats, they are wearing this little custom-made vest, and at the front of their chest is a ball. And if my rats detect pangolin scales, they will pull this ball, which in turn triggers a micro switch and then gives a beeping sound. So this is how my rats tell me that whatever they are smelling right now smells like pangolin. And then what happens is if they are correct, they get the click and food reward. So the next time they smell pangolin, they sure will want to pull this ball again. We've just recently completed our first trials where we went to the seaport in Dar es Salaam here in Tanzania, which is a huge port. And we took six of our research rats that have been working on this project to test how what we've been coming up with in the field, how that works in the real world. And we're very happy that they did so well. They found over 83% of the wildlife targets that we planted. So for these trials, what we did is we took pangolin scales, for example, and placed them somewhere inside a shipping container or inside the warehouse and asked our rats to search for it. So they did an outstanding job. They worked really well in this very busy, loud, stinky environment. Again, credit to their adaptability. And yeah, we've learned a lot of really valuable lessons that we're now applying with the next generation. And we're hopeful that this will become another program where we are really implementing these rats to help detect traffic wildlife and combat the loss of wildlife. That's amazing. I think humans live in such a site-based world, but in the actual world, there's so many smells that are around. There's so many different ways that animals are tuned into the world around them. And so it's really fascinating to be partnered with an animal that has different ways to appreciate the world and sense through it. It is really interesting to see all of the different applications of the ways that you can use that. I know that these hero rats can also help humans in many ways. And like you said at the start, they can help catch cases of tuberculosis. Additionally, you're also leading a project of helping these rats be trained to help find survivors in collapsed buildings. Can you tell us, like, how do you even go about starting that project and kind of some of the goals there? Yeah, so our search and rescue rats, one of the other applications that we're working on. How do you go about it? I don't think anyone really knows. It's a lot of trial and error and taking our best guess. Of course, we have a lot of knowledge on animal training and how our rats work and what works well for them. But when it comes to something new like this, you really just fishing <laughs> and going in and be like, let's try this. I think this will work. And then you test and continuously monitor and evaluate what you are doing to check how it's working out and then adapt from there. So our search and rescue rats are trained in a big building, which is empty. And we just filled it with a whole lot of debris and basically rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> to make it look a bit more like a collapsed building. And these rats began to be trained early on to go up to a person. They're also wearing this little vest and pull the ball and then come back. They're also trained that if I'm releasing them somewhere and I'm playing a sound, you are coming back to where you've been released from. Because if we think about deploying them in a disaster zone, the whole point is that they are small so they can fit into the rubble, but we can't follow. So we need to make sure that they can come back to us and be safe. And then from there, it is taking steps up slowly, increasing the complexity in the environment, putting down distracting things like shoes and clothes to make sure your rat really learns to find the person. And yeah, just testing. And if you see, okay, something might have gone wrong here, you're adapting, you might have to take a step back and yeah, going from there. But it's also a really cool project and it's been going really well now. That's amazing to hear. And again, that goes back to the partnership. You're learning just as much from the rats as the rats are learning from you on how to detect these things. So there truly is that mutualism there. What do you think is the biggest threat to wildlife currently and then looking into the future here? I think if we are looking at recent trends, it used to be poaching and trafficking of wildlife. But I think we, we see a big trend also for wildlife to have increasing conflict with humans. So human-wildlife conflict, which is not related to our project, but now scientists and organizations are looking to create human-wildlife coexistence. So if you think about a country like Tanzania, where you have national parks that don't have a fence around them, and then you have a community that lives nearby, and you are planting your crops on which you depend to feed yourself and your family, and at night the elephants come and they eat all of your crops. That creates a lot of conflict. Elephants can be incredibly dangerous. You do not want to go out and chase them away. But at the same time, this is your livelihood. So this is, I think, one of the leading threats that we're seeing with the increasing closeness between wildlife and people and trying to find methods to coexist. 
the opposite side of that question is, what do you think needs to be studied more in the future with animals? That could be related to your work here. That could just be in general. Everything. I think if you look at the trend in science, the more we look into it, the more we find that a wider and wider range of species has very extended capacity for suffering, for emotions, for intelligence. So I think there's a lot that we can do in order to understand better just how smart other species are and how social they are, how their lives work, which will also help to protect them more and see them more as another species that we're sharing the planet with. And advancing welfare studies, I always say welfare isn't a yes or no, it's on a sliding scale, but that doesn't mean that the scale can't expand to be better and better. So these are things that for me personally, I'm, I'm very passionate about and I think are very important. But also I think there's a big need to find ways that human and wildlife can form symbiotic relationships so both of them benefit. Because otherwise I think the conflict is always going to outweigh if there's no sort of symbiotic coexistence between species. Hopefully we can push for that. And I liked what you said about looking into the animals more and just the more we take that magnifying lens and look at unique species. I think every time we do that, we're surprised by what we learn, whether that's on their cognition or the emotional spectrum of things. But it seems like every time that we take a little bit of time to research an animal, we're always surprised at how they're much more complex than we had originally thought. What advice would you give to people who are curious about working with animals or wildlife or even getting into this field? One piece of advice that I used to give students when I was teaching a lot was to take some time after school to figure out what you want to do and not rush into spending a lot of money on studying or learning a job if you're not sure about it, which parents don't like to hear. <laughs> But I can only speak from my personal experience where if I hadn't taken the time to realize that there's a degree in a different country that is really what I want to do, I probably would be in some other job that didn't make me as happy and I wouldn't be as good at it. Take the time to figure out what you're really passionate about because you're going to have to spend a lot of time at work or at uni studying something. So you want to make sure you're enjoying it. And then... Also, I think understanding that the need for cooperation and for human welfare is a big thing that comes in more on the conservation side, where we're not going to be able to conserve species and achieve great welfare for animals across the globe if we're not achieving good welfare for people across the globe. As long as my child is going hungry, I will not care about the dog outside. So I think that's something that often is underestimated. And even personally, coming from a history of I care about animals and I don't care about people, you're not going to get there if people aren't happy and healthy as well. So we really need to strive to try and work towards something where we're all happy. Very wise words. And I'll praise you, Izzy. I know <laughs> uh, I think the work that you're doing is incredible. And so I think that's great advice to yeah, take that time, look around at all of the options and explore. There's seasonal internships or positions. And those are great because they let you get little tastes of, oh, maybe I like working in the field, or maybe I like being more behind the computer and running statistics. And so I think that's great advice of just see what's out there. You don't have to always have this plan. Some people do know early on from a young age, they want to be a vet and they stay on that trail. And then others, yeah, that trail meanders and takes them to lots of places. I always like to end these conversations with how best people can support the work that you do. But Apopo truly has a great way of supporting by adopting some of these animal heroes. I know as I was building up the research for this, I just got swept away by everything. And so I adopted one of the rats. But can you tell listeners about the adoption process and then maybe other ways that they can support your work? Yeah, sure. Thank you, first of all, for doing that. That's great. With Apopo, you can adopt or sponsor one of our rats or dogs. And we have a few sort of flagship animals, which you can choose. Financial adoption package, which in turn, you get regular updates about how your rat is doing. If they are still in training, you get to hear about where they are at and how they're progressing. Or if they are already in the field, you get to hear how many TB patients they detected or how many landmines they found. So you really get to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with your animal on how they're doing and what good they've been doing. He's also made great gifts. If you want to give a gift to someone who you know is into that kind of stuff, you give them an adoption. 
other ways to support, there's also one-off donations you can make to us, which of course financial is always appreciated. Running all of this and employing all the staff and everything that goes into it costs money. But otherwise, I think something else that's really important for us is just to spread the word about rats aren't bad. They do some really cool stuff. The more people that talk about it, the better. So you can follow us on social media and you get very cute rat videos stuffing their cheek pouches with lots of food and enjoying the weekend. It's called Full Cheek Friday and just sharing the post and sharing the knowledge. <laughs> Izzy, thank you so much for being part of this and for taking the time and talking today about the amazing work that you do, the amazing work that Apopo does. Mm-hmm. And listeners, again, if you're curious, you can visit their website to learn much more. You can sponsor rats. I sponsored Baraka. So you can join me in that. I'm excited to see how their journey in landmine detection goes. But thank you so much for taking the time and having the conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed this conversation, subscribe. And to find out more about the work we do to support animals, visit our website at theechofilm.com. Follow us on Instagram at theechoanimals and follow our TikTok at creature.feature. On behalf of all creatures, big and small, thank you for listening.